Well, Alibaba had them 40 thieves. Sherazade had a thousand tails. Hello and welcome back to Wally Gisnep's Animated Classics, a podcast where we're chronologically re-watching all of the Walt Disney animated classics to see which ones really stand up to that prestigious title, albeit in our case, a Wally Gisnep animated classic. As always, I am Liam and I'm joined by my very good friend Ben. Ben, which film are we taking a look at this week? Tonight Liam is going to be an Arabian night because we are looking at 1992's Aladdin. Before we dive in and talk about this film in more detail, what are your memories and your background with this film? This was probably my favourite Disney film as a child. Probably because it's got a boy in it and I've talked in the past how averse I was to all of the princess films. But interestingly as well, I swear that one of my earliest memories is watching this in the cinema. But my parents insist that they wouldn't take what was probably a two-year-old at the time to a cinema. And yet, here we are. I think I looked it up and this was released in a time where there was at least a six to 12 month lag between US and UK cinemas. So actually, I think this was released in November 1993. So it would have been three. But still, to my mum and dad, you shouldn't be taking a three-year-old to a cinema. And no matter how much they say they didn't, someone did. (laughs) Well, that turned dark very quickly. What about yourself? What is your background with this film? I don't believe I watched this one much as a child. I think I maybe saw it a couple of times. But now I'm older, it's one I'm always happy to watch. It's an incredibly fun film, and I think there's a reason it's so loved. So let's start with a little bit of a background. This is the third of what I've sort of dubbed the Howard Ashman trilogy, where it's the three films that he and Alan Menken work together as lyricist and songwriter for. But actually, this is a film that Howard Ashman himself pitched to the studio because he, when he was younger, he had been involved in a musical version of Aladdin and it was a story he really enjoyed. So he pitched an adaptation of the story where the twist was that the musical numbers and particularly the character of the genie was inspired by that sort of 1930s, 1940s jazzy Cab Calloway style of music, which we get absolutely in the number friend like me but it was originally a sort of a stronger through line of the original treatment the studio originally rejected the idea but they had their treatment and a few of the songs written and eventually ashman and menken were pulled onto beauty and the beast but after that wrapped the studio took the treatment and began fleshing it out albeit now with tim rice as a lyricist since howard ashman had tragically recently died we also get the return of... Jafar? <laughs> What's that? Why, I, I'm always going to make this. It's Ron Clements and John Musker. So we're going to have this conversation every time they come up. John and Ron Clements and Musker. <laughs> In no particular order as directors. I think the other key threads to the background of Aladdin is the film The Thief and the Cobbler, which started production in the 60s and was still unfinished when Aladdin came out. And in many ways is still unfinished to this day. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, yeah, fair point. It remains effectively unfinished. And this was the passion project of animator Richard Williams. And we'll probably do another podcast on The Thief and the Cobbler once we've gone through all the Disney films and Pixar and Don Bluth and... Rover Dangerfield, (laughs) because it has its own complex production hell it went through involving funding and it being with different studios, and eventually Richard Williams, despite working on it for three decades, was fired off it, and they put together a, a hasty cut and changed a load of bits of it because Aladdin came out. And the reason that was such a reaction to that is because these films are incredibly similar. I think often... At the time, I think The Thief and the Cobbler was unfavourably compared to Aladdin because it came out afterwards. There's some grey areas as to how much Aladdin was or wasn't influenced by it. I'll say this, The Thief and the Cobbler is about a penniless young man who lives on the streets, who falls in love with a beautiful princess. Her dad is an incompetent sultan who's being manipulated by an evil royal vizier. And there's 
a character with blue skin and a black pointy beard. So yeah, it's there's a lot of similarities in terms of design. There is a lot of interesting history to it, and as a piece of animation, it's superb. As a story, it's a total mess. Richard Williams was clearly an animator first, and a writer, director, overall filmmaker second. But we're not here to talk about The Thief and the Cobbler. We're here to go to the sunny skies of Agrabah. Liam, shall we dive into Aladdin? Just before we do, I'd like to just touch very briefly on the setting, which is this is set, as you say, in the fictional city of Agrabah. And I'm amazed that for somewhere that doesn't actually exist, it manages to be so vaguely offensive. (laughs) (laughs) So interestingly, I watched this on Disney Plus, and now when you watch it on Disney Plus, you get a screen pops up for 10 seconds before the film will start playing, which gives you the sort of the heads up that it contains cultural depictions that are inappropriate, they were inappropriate at the time, and that they would just like to acknowledge this before you watch the film. So I quite like that they're doing it that way. Generally, I do think the film isn't too bad. It handles it fairly respectfully, but of course, I'm saying that as a white man talking about a studio of white men. There are Definitely problems with this. The depiction of justice is a big one that comes up in this film. There's also a lyric in the opening number about basically the Middle East being, hey, it's barbaric, but it's home. And these are all things that people rightfully question. But having seen the remake, you get an insight to how you could do it a little bit better. Though, frankly, I'll get into the remake later. The remake still falls short in a few of those areas. So, like, there's definitely a way to go but the solution is often just if you are depicting a culture have people of that culture involved in the production of your film which was not the case here i think there's a clear journey from the crows in dumbo and the i don't want to have to use the term but what's what they're called as redskins in peter pan and a film like moana where this is depicting a culture that disney hasn't shown on film before and as you say they make the wise decision to (laughs) properly research it, but also have people from that cultural background working on the film. I'd say Aladdin and some of the other films we've got coming up, they fall into a slightly different category to those early films from the 40s, 50s and 60s, which was just using other cultures as the butt of a joke. And I think this falls into well-meaning ignorance. I think we're going to get something very similar in Pocahontas. I'd say we arguably got that in The Rescuers Down Under with Australian culture. (laughs) There was nothing well-meaning about The Rescuers Down Under. (laughs) Let's jump on our magic carpets then and fly off to Agrabah and get into the plot of Aladdin. So we begin with the opening number of Arabian Nights, which I think, cultural issues aside, is a really solid song. I think it's very catchy. It sets the tone of the film very well. And we get these beautiful shots of this fictional city of Agrabah. I say city of Agrabah. It's basically a palace and then a city that is the same size as the palace. Yeah, it's a classic Cinderella design choice. (laughs) (laughs) And I've got to say straight away, this looked probably like the most expensive film we've seen so far. Like, I've got a great amount of fondness for what they were able to do with the cap system in Rescuers Down Under, but this looks like a lot of money was poured into it. The animation is absolutely fantastic. I looked it up and The Little Mermaid like was way ahead of it. I think The Little Mermaid was 40 million budget and this was like 28 million. This is a very cinematic opening and it depicts a little merchant man traveling into Agrabah, the fictional city where the film is set. And he opens up his stall and it's basically just an opportunity for Robin Williams to improvise and the animators to work around it. I think it's moved past fan theory to confirmed canon now, but it's accepted that this merchant being the only other character voiced by Genie and this opening taking place after the events of the film, this character is the Genie after he is granted his freedom and he decides to be a little merchant man who goes around peddling crap. Spoilers for if you haven't seen this film. (laughs) One thing I enjoy as well is that at the end of Aladdin 3 and the Prince of Thieves, full title, they have a closing segment with this merchant again, which I think was mostly them just celebrating the fact that they got Robin Williams back for the third one. But it's nice that the whole 
trilogy. <laughs> it's weird calling it a trilogy because two of them are very cheap. But that the whole trilogy is bookended by this merchant, which I think is quite nice. And I think lends a bit more sort of evidence for that confirmation from the directors. And so it's this merchant who shows us an old oil lamp. And as the camera pans away, because the audience realizes we're being hustled, I suppose, he tells us not to judge something by outward appearances, because this lamp once changed the fortune of a young man. And then he proceeds to tell us the story of Aladdin. But before you can tell the story of Aladdin, you first have to jump to a scene involving Jafar. Which is weird because, as you say, the theme of this film is that you shouldn't judge things by appearances. But a lot of the problems of this film are the fact that people aren't judging Jafar by his appearance. Because they're going, (laughs) I think I can trust this guy. You can't trust him. One thing I really like about Aladdin is that arguably the main relationship in this film is between Aladdin and Jafar, perhaps more than any other characters. Partly in terms of plots, they're constantly interacting with each other and working against each other's machinations. But also, I really like it when a Disney film has the hero and the villain be in the same situation but deal with it differently. So both of them know they're capable of more, and Aladdin accepts his lot and tries to help people and hopes that one day things will work out for him. Whereas Jafar... He feels he's capable of more and he's just going to screw over everyone else to get it. I disagree. I much prefer when the hero and the villain never interact until the villain offers the hero everything they've ever wanted before being dragged to hell. (laughs) Just on a side note, when I was compiling the most common causes of death in Disney films, dragged to hell is surprisingly (laughs) high on the list. Yeah, I think one of the really strong points of this film is its villain, Jafar. I've said before that Captain Hook is my favourite Disney villain, but Captain Hook walked so that Jafar could run. Fantastically voiced by Jonathan Freeman, who spent a couple of years working on this character because there were so many changes to the direction they wanted to go with Aladdin. He was constantly changing the voice and re-recording lines. The role of Jafar and quite a lot of other characters changed a lot during this film. There's two different songs that were recorded for Jafar that were cut. Similarly, early drafts of the film had Aladdin's mother be a prominent character in the film. Obviously, she's nowhere to be seen. Yeah, so this all comes down to revisiting the project after Howard Ashman died. So all of the stuff that was in the original draft was before they had worked on Beauty and the Beast. And it's all from that sort of 40-page treatment and a handful of full songs ready to go for the film that was just rejected by the studio. That's all there. And it's when they revisited it that they kind of started from scratch writing a new script, but tried to keep the elements that they thought worked. And a lot of the other elements did just, they had to go. In fact, there's a song that I absolutely love that found its way into the musical version and it's called Proud of Your Boy and you can see demos of it on YouTube and the directors and Alan Menken talk about it and they talk about how difficult it was to cut the song when the film just changed because they'd just lost their friend Howard Ashman and it was clearly something that meant a lot to him and they had to cut that, they had to cut the mum. Changing Jafar I don't think they were as attached to. (laughs) And I do really like the end result of Jafar, who, again, we can't mention Jafar without mentioning probably the best villain sidekick in all of Disney, which is Iago, voiced brilliantly by Gilbert Gottfried. And (laughs) there's not really a performance going on here. It's similar to Robin Williams just in a booth and they'll animate that afterwards. They just got Gilbert Gottfried and we're like, just talk and we'll write around you. And he was like, by talk, do you mean shout? (laughs) Because that's my default. It's a fantastic pairing. Jafar, for reference, is my favourite character in any Disney film. So I love watching this performance. And it just works exceptionally well. Jafar is constantly deadpan and just annoyed by the world. And Iago's big and shouty and dumb. It's fantastic. And the first time we see them, Jafar has got one of his henchmen, Gazim, to get the other half of a golden scarab. When the pieces are connected, it flies off and reveals the entrance to the Cave of Wonders. 
This is one of those early examples of CG that's just blended really well and works fantastically. Again, very vivid image in my mind is seeing the Cave of Wonders on the big screen and just being blown away. But again, I mean, I was three. It doesn't take much to impress a three-year-old, but I think this would impress a nine-year-old even. <laughs> Now, 10-year-olds, you're getting into (laughs) rocky territory, but nine. And so the cave warns Gazim and Jafar that only one may enter, only the diamond in the rough. Uh, Gazim introduces himself, steps in, and the cave immediately decides that this isn't the right person and just closes, presumably killing him, or at the very least, trapping him in the Cave of Wonders. I mean, he's never seen again, so it's reasonable to assume he's dead. I am very much of the opinion that Jafar knew... (laughs) <laughs> what was going to happen I don't think he knew exactly the specifics of it but he was like I need to test what happens when you go inside and if I do this I don't have to pay him so this is a win-win for me <laughs> but of course in great cinematic language we're told that only the diamond in the rough can enter Jafar is wondering who that is we immediately cut to our hero Aladdin Now, Aladdin is one of those elements that changed over the production of this film. I think in the original draft, he was a lot younger. He was a lot weedier. He was kind of inspired by your Michael J. Fox kind of approach to a hero. A loser. Basically, yeah, he's a loser. And I really enjoyed that Jeffrey Katzenberg, when they were working on the film, went, that doesn't make any sense. Why would the smoking hot princess go for this weedy loser? Completely missing the point of the film. And so they changed him to more of a romantic lead and the final design is heavily inspired by Tom Cruise. If nothing else, they went, Aladdin needs to have great hair and great pecs. (laughs) So we'll start there. If I had pecs like that, I'd only wear a waistcoat all the time as well. (laughs) So our introduction to Aladdin is him stealing right away, I believe. And we are greeted to the song one jump ahead which i really like i think it tells us who aladdin is right away it's a very good i am song as they are shows us his situation in life and how he handles it though it does have probably my favorite lyric so this is one that was written by tim rice instead and it has a part where a woman is questioning why aladdin is such a scoundrel and she says i'd blame parents except he hasn't got them and i think well there's your answer then isn't it I love how it must be very traumatic being an orphan growing up on the streets and he's got nothing, nothing at all. And she's just quite annoyed that he doesn't have any parents. Like, what a dick. (laughs) He doesn't quite have nothing. He does have a monkey. He does have a monkey, Abu, who is just a kleptomaniac. That's (laughs) his character trait. Does Abu contribute in any positive way to the plot? He does steal the lamp off Jafar later on. Ah, okay, yeah, that's fine. Without which Aladdin would be dead. So he does get some points for that. Also in this sequence, there's a line where the chorus girls sing, since Aladdin hit the bottom, he's become a one-man rising crime. And every time I mishear it as since he's hit the bottle, he's become a (laughs) one-man rising crime, which is a very different tone. So the song basically just takes us on a very stereotypical view through an Arabian street and market it also introduces us to the guards who i really enjoy particularly the head guard razul voiced by winnie the pooh not sterling holloway, not sterling holloway. <laughs> he's dead they didn't use archive footage i haven't checked to see if this is jim cummings first performance with disney but if you've watched any animated thing in the last 30 years there's a 90 percent chance jim cummings does a voice in it it's, I believe it's his first film role. He'd worked as Winnie the Pooh on a lot of the TV shows with them, but this is his first film role. One thing I really enjoy about Jim Cummings is he has two modes and that's it. He has Gruff Angry Man and Winnie the Pooh. And he's got a third mode, which is impersonating Jeremy Irons. <laughs> Just to be clear, when he's playing the character of Razul, the gruff captain of the guards, he's doing the gruff man voice, not the voice of <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. But if you've ever played the Baldur's Gate games, it's exactly the same voice as Minsk, which is the character he voices in those games. I like that you assume someone listening to this podcast won't have seen Aladdin, but has played the Baldur's Gate games. <laughs> 
But all of this song doesn't tell us everything we need to know about Aladdin. It shows us what everyone thinks of him and how he survives. But then we get this lovely scene afterwards where just as he and Abu have escaped, they break the bread and they notice two children rummaging, trying to find some food. And Aladdin just gives them their food after all of that hard work, basically telling us whilst he steals to survive, he cares about more than just himself great introduction to our character everything we need to know about him this is our diamond in the rough and very quickly aladdin has to save these children again because they almost get run over by a prince riding a horse he seemingly is going to meet the princess the prince is about to whip the kids and aladdin tanks that whip like a boss he just takes it round the forearm pulls it out of the guy's hand if i was in that crowd i probably would have applauded But for some reason, instead of applauding, everyone laughs at Aladdin after he's thrown to the dirt, as if the prince thinks any better of all the other people in the crowd. Like, know what side you're on, guys. I don't think the tenets of Marxism had reached Agrabah by this stage. (laughs) I have to say, Prince Ahmed is probably my favourite design of any minor character in a Disney film. Like... They put so much thought into this ridiculous design and he's in it for about 20 seconds total. (laughs) He's got this stupid moustache, this big purple outfit. And on top of that, he has, as we see in a later scene, boxes with little hearts on them, which leads to a bit of an animation goof that kind of annoys me, but we'll get to that. I'm glad you noticed that as well. (laughs) Meanwhile... Jafar has returned to the palace and to find the diamond in the rough, he needs a jeweled ring from the Sultan. I like the Sultan, but my God, he's incompetent. The joke I particularly like is he's just playing with his toys and not really doing anything and just bumbling about. And then you get this ominous shadow and he looks up and goes, ah, Jafar, my most trusted advisor. (laughs) And this is without Jafar even using his magic hypnotism stick. This is just Jafar Vanilla. I genuinely don't think he needs the magic hypnotism stick. (laughs) So yeah, the Sultan is convinced to hand over this jewel so that Jafar can find an appropriate suitor for Jasmine. And the Sultan goes to console his daughter after she has clearly rejected Prince Ahmed. By clearly rejected, you mean have her enormous tiger maul him. Yes. So (laughs) as the Sultan is leaving, he sees that Prince Ahmed has had his trousers torn at his bum. This is how we see his underwear and goes off in a huff. And then we immediately see Princess Jasmine's pet tiger, massive tiger, Raja, holding the wrong material in his mouth. Well, you say it's the wrong material because it's got the same heart pattern printed on it, but you don't know... Prince Ahmed doesn't wear simultaneously two identical pairs of boxers. So it could have torn through the trousers, torn the first pair of boxers, and then the second pair of boxers is showing. That's a perfectly rational explanation. (laughs) Yeah, that makes as much sense. Weirdly enough, I'd never noticed this goof for years, but the last time I was watching it, my friend who I was watching with, it was all they could see. They were just like, that's the wrong material. And now the film is rubbish as a result. They literally got up and left. (laughs) (laughs) What do we think of the character of Jasmine then? Jasmine is a lot of people's favourite Disney princess. And I can see why. Like over this film, she's really well fleshed out. Immediately we're shown that she's very confident. She knows what she wants. She isn't afraid to tell her father that she's not happy with the situation she's in. And that she feels that being forced to get married just because it's the law isn't okay and it's not for her. So we immediately have our heroine's motivation for her character, like straight away, and I think it's really good. One thing that I find really interesting about Jasmine is I think this was the first time Disney had used a different actor for the singing voice and the speaking voice. In both Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, the characters all sang their own songs, whereas here they've got Linda Larkin doing the speaking voice. And don't get me wrong, it's a fantastic performance. But we also have Leah Salonga doing the singing voice. And I don't really understand why they didn't just get Leah Salonga to do the full performance as they had done in the previous two Howard Ashman, Alan Menken films, where they get Broadway stars for their leads. And for some reason, they get a different voice actor. And that's a trend we're going to see continued from here on out. And we've only recently, in the last few years, started 
casting actors who do the full performance and i'm glad we're back to that but it's just a really weird start of a trend and i just really wish they'd given the full role to leah salonga i know more than one person who when they were at secondary school they were cast as the singing voice in a musical and then they'd get the what they considered to be the more attractive performer to actually perform the thing on stage so they'd mime and the other person would have to sing backstage because they had a nice voice but weren't considered to be pretty enough so (laughs) there's definitely a precedent for that sort of thing in the world of entertainment i genuinely can't believe a school would do that in a post singing in the rain world the sultan tells jasmine then that she has to be married within the next three days and jasmine doing anything to avoid that fate and being stuck with a man she doesn't love decides to escape There's a nice little moment where Raja just looks up at her sadly, but then uses his head to help her climb out of the castle walls. Meanwhile, and I think I'm going to be saying meanwhile a lot in Aladdin because it jumps about all over the place in terms of plot, but meanwhile, Jafar is doing some weird (laughs) Frankenstein-type experiment with a machine that generates a storm and he has to hit the Sultan's ring with lightning to find out where the diamond in the rough is. I don't understand why Jafar is not a world-famous inventor at this point. He created a machine that can generate a storm simply from bird power. Yeah, that's better technology than we have now in the real world. (laughs) So Jafar sees the image of the person who is the diamond in the rough. I don't know how he knows who that is and to send the guards after this person because... It's a big city. Could be anyone. He's like, I'll draw a sketch and send and give it to Razul. Find the most handsome young man you can who's always got his pecs out. He's the one. That does narrow it down, probably, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the attire alone would do it. It's like, he's always showing off. Meanwhile, Jasmine is exploring the streets of Agrabah. This is the first time she's ever left the palace and... She's overwhelmed by the market. It's a really nice experience. She picks up an apple to give to a small child and the owner of the stall immediately threatens to cut off her hand. I don't know how culturally insensitive this is, but I'm going to assume this sequence is at least a bit culturally insensitive. But it's cinematically engaging, so we're okay with it. Just to be clear, Liam's doing the voice of a business exec at Disney in the (laughs) early 90s. That's not his own opinion. You can't see me miming the cigar. (laughs) aladdin seeing jasmine and seeing that she's hot just to be clear like (laughs) it's genuinely something i really like about aladdin and jasmine's relationship so later on in the film it's oh they're in love and they're a perfect couple etc but i think in the first half of the film really what we establish is these are just two attractive young people who have met someone else they're attracted to and i think it is just quite superficial and i don't think that's a bad thing i actually think they capture that sort of youthful desire quite well and i think it's quite sweet because they both see something in the other one there's also the other character aspects of the other one represents what they see as freedom so for jasmine it's not having any rules to follow i'd argue aladdin does have rules to follow he just doesn't follow them because he breaks the law all the time (laughs) and for aladdin jasmine represents the freedom of having money and not having to constantly fight to survive i'll jump ahead but i really enjoy that moment where after their day together they've gone to aladdin's hole in a wall that he lives in And there's this nice moment where they're both talking about how terrible their own lives are and how they feel trapped. And they both say trapped at the same time as if we're supposed to see this connection between these two characters. But I'm like, no, no, no. Aladdin is literally living day to day and stealing to survive. Your concern was people tell you what to wear. Now, Abu doesn't really speak proper English, but I think if he could, he'd be explaining Maslow's hierarchy of needs in this scene. (laughs) Because, yeah, don't get me wrong, other people having it worse in no way diminishes your problems. And, yes, being forced to marry against your will, being kept inside palace walls, and people telling you what you can do and what you can wear, like, those are terrible. But it's very different to someone who is only ever one day away from starving to death or being killed. But Aladdin being the diamond in the rough that he is saves 
Jasmine from having her hand cut off by using his charm and his wit. I particularly like this little scene because he basically pretends Jasmine's completely mad and she just goes along with it. And again, I think it puts Jasmine in a really good light. She doesn't just let things happen to her. She goes along with it and she's clever. Again, when they're travelling up to Aladdin's little den he lives in, he jumps across two buildings using a stick and makes a little bridge for Jasmine, but she just jumps herself and says, I'm a fast learner, and she very much is. Yeah, I think the relationship between these two characters is really well established. I don't necessarily buy that this is true love, and they've spent months together, like Belle and the Beast, where they've really got to know each other and see what the other one's personality is, but I still really like them as a couple. And also, they obviously share a love of having their midriffs constantly exposed. (laughs) And so whilst they're at Aladdin's house, the guards show up, and they need to escape the guards. Eventually, the guards catch up to them, and they both think that they're the ones they're after. But it is in this case, actually, that the guards have been sent by Jafar to get the sexy man with the exposed pecs, at which point Jasmine steps in trying to order the guards to release him. There's a weird line here where Razul says, look what we have here, a street mouse, in reference to everyone calling Aladdin a street rat. And I just think, that's not how rats and mice work. Look, Liam, we've established from Basil and the rescuers that Disney doesn't really understand how these creatures work. (laughs) But it's at this point that Jasmine reveals that she is the princess and despite being taken aback by this, the guards can't do anything. They're under direct orders from Jafar and they take Aladdin to the dungeons. Despite having a taste of freedom, Jasmine storms back to the castle and demands Jafar release Aladdin and Jafar just freewheeling and just lying through his teeth says that the boy has been sentenced to death and there's a really nice moment jasmine looks sort of shocked and crestfallen and heartbroken and then after a short pause after he says death he just says by beheading like as if that was (laughs) (laughs) just totally unnecessarily gonna give graphic detail i kind of overlooked this as a kid that jasmine entirely thinks this man is dead which is quite important because a big part of the film is why wouldn't you know it's kind of like the superman situation of like just because you put glasses on it's still clearly the same person and just because you wear a nice outfit you're still aladdin but context wise the boy she met is dead she only spent half a day with him a prince shows up looks vaguely familiar but yeah i can completely believe that she wouldn't immediately know that it's i mean she figures it out so great Uh, Yeah, I really enjoy this scene. But of course, Aladdin hasn't been sentenced to death. He's just chained up in the dungeon where (laughs) Jafar decides to visit him in probably the best disguise, (laughs) just as a hunched over eccentric old man. And my question is, is are those fake teeth or does Jafar normally wear fake teeth? (laughs) It's not very clear. I don't know exactly what the limitations of regular Jafar's magic powers are, but there's definitely something about trust here, because Aladdin's in a dungeon, and this creepy guy scuttles out of the darkness, and is like, you want to make some money, boy? And he goes, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> you seem legit. I really like it. It's basically just what happens in The Count of Monte Cristo. But, you know, instead of taking place over ten years, it's a two-minute conversation. And instead of being an academic monk... It's just a crazy old man with a parrot for a hump. I also think George R. R. Martin saw this sequence and went, yeah, I can get a book out of that. <laughs> <laughs> so Jafar and Aladdin travel back to the Cave of Wonders. Jafar, still in disguise, tells Aladdin to claim the lamp and the rest of the treasure is his. The Cave of Wonders does say touch nothing but the lamp. So it's pretty clear that Aladdin isn't going to get anything out of this. But, you know, he, he goes along for the ride. Why not? Does... Touching the carpet count. Apparently not. (laughs) (laughs) The cave just does not value the carpet as treasure. Which is nuts. I suppose it's not a thing, it's a being, so maybe it doesn't count? I don't know. Either way, there are some very weird and specific rules here in place, but Aladdin knows that he's got a job to do, and he finds the lamp with the help of... The magic carpet, uh, which, if we haven't mentioned, is a magic (laughs) carpet. It's just a magic carpet. It can fly. I really like the animation on the magic carpet. They drew the design, but then loaded it into a 3D model. So whilst carpet himself is a 3D model, the details, like the tassels, are traditionally animated, and the texture of the carpet is traditionally animated. 
which I think is a really nice way of blending 3D animation. Because I think often early 3D films where they fall down is those textures. One of my favorite details of Toy Story is looking at all the backgrounds where it's just a repeated texture and it's like wood grain, just a flat image of wood grain repeated over and over again. It's just very charming. But yeah, what they did on carpet, fantastic animation. Carpet leads them to the lamp in this big, very like domineering room, which always makes me think of the video game now, which also, by the way, Aladdin, probably the first Disney film to have an excellent video game. I swear to God, if you're trying to crowbar in a discussion about Kingdom Hearts, I'm just going to cut it. (laughs) The lamp is atop this huge volcanic rock. The lighting is fantastic as well. And we've got this nice sort of cutting back and forth where Aladdin is approaching the lamp and a boo kleptomaniac that he is has been entranced by this giant ruby held by this terrifying looking statue, culminating in them both grabbing their respective items at the same time and the cave of wonders deciding that they broke the rules and will now be burned by lava it seems like a reasonable reaction carpet's really taken to aladdin and decides to help him escape i think they do such a good job with carpet because it doesn't have any dialogue it doesn't have a face but it's honestly one of the most lovable sidekicks in a disney film just from its physicality and the fact it just takes to Aladdin I think it makes it really really adorable and it uses its flying abilities to swoop Aladdin and Abu out of peril and round and about back to the entrance of the cave. The cave is falling apart but Aladdin manages to grab on to the remnants of the step at the entrance of the cave and Jafar is going to help him. Aladdin says, I can't pull myself up. You're going to have to grab me. And Jafar rightfully says, first give me the lamp and then I'll help you. And for some reason, Aladdin decides this is a good thing to do. At which point the old man facade sort of melts away and Jafar just tries to stab Aladdin, which he didn't really need to do. He could have just walked away. But as you alluded to earlier, it's at this point that Abu jumps in to save Aladdin. He bites Jafar, making him drop the dagger and jumps back to Aladdin as they fall into the Cave of Wonders as it closes. And it's at this point that Jafar celebrates his victory only to realise that the lamp is gone. You probably all know what's coming next, but... (laughs) A hard cut to Aladdin on the corpse of Azim. (laughs) Surprisingly enough, no. What we have next is Aladdin trying to think of a way out of the cave... He examines the lamp that he went through all this trouble to get, and on rubbing it, we get the genie. Before we talk about Robin Williams' performance, I just want to talk a little bit about the design of the genie. I think it's good to look at the cultural conception of what a genie was before this point. I think normally it was spelt D-J-I-N-N-I rather than the sort of more anglicised G-E-N-I-E version. And also, from what I can see, they tended to be depicted as red. And I know at one point they wanted to do the Disney one as green, but obviously blue is what they went for, and obviously it's a very memorable design. This is a lot of people's favourite Disney characters, and I think it all comes down to the performance because the character was built from the ground up with Robin Williams in mind. I think this is generally well known at this point, but we should really touch on it. Musker and Clements had Robin Williams in mind. They asked him, he said no. So they got an animator to take some of Robin Williams' stand-up and animate the character of the genie over this stand-up to sort of show him the vision they had. And he absolutely loved it. Decided to do it. Did it at scale as well, which is incredible. This is Robin Williams, one of the biggest names in Hollywood at the time. Did it at scale so that he would have something to show his children. Like he just had children who were very young and a lot of his films generally skewed a bit older, at least up to this point. It was all on the condition that his character wasn't used in merchandise and that in the promotion of the film, he never took up more than 25% of the marketing because they just weren't things he was comfortable with. He was doing it because he liked the idea of the film and he wanted something to show his kids. Disney agreed. Jeffrey Katzenberg went back on that. (laughs) very quickly and it led to a whole feud between disney and robin williams that only really ended with an apology from michael eisner that also came along an original picasso as a gift to robin williams 
It's insane. I also love whenever you look at the posters and other marketing for Aladdin, where he was like, I don't want Genie to take up more than 25%. They went, okay, well, we'll put Genie taking up exactly 25%, and then all the other characters taking up about 10%. So (laughs) we've technically done that, but the Genie still is the big standout in the visual design. That aside, this is one of the best performances in animation history, I think. I, I'd agree. I don't think there's a huge amount to say on it in some ways, really. I absolutely adore this performance, but I don't adore what it led to because I think this character works exceptionally well with both Robin Williams' performance and how it adapts to his mannerisms and obviously the fact he can change shape and the way the characters react to him referencing Jack Nicholson or Arnold Schwarzenegger they're just confused they're like uh, okay sure and they just go along with it what we get after this point is writers at Disney going hey people like the genie let's have other characters just reference popular culture and break the fourth wall all the time and it doesn't work because genie's meant to be this all-powerful being who can see through time and space and dimensions and The characters of Hercules aren't those things. Yeah, a lot of people have argued that this film was the start of the celebrity casting in animated films, and I disagree. I think that this was clearly the most successful one that led to the craze, but really that began with Jeffrey Katzenberg's vision and casting in Oliver and Company. But you're right, what this did lead to is genie knockoffs and... It makes sense in this film. It's weird. My friend pointed out that she loves that for a creature beyond time and space, all of his references seem very 80s focused. (laughs) Just one particular decade that he loved and everything else he's like, eh. He references Peter Laurie at one point, which is before (laughs) then. But yeah, it makes sense. It's part of the genie character. The various comic relief side characters after this point are all pale imitations of the genie and it feels very forced at times whereas it was natural and integral to the character this time but of course as you're probably familiar with the story and with the culture review of genies the purpose of this character is to grant three wishes to their master there are of course a few limitations The classic, no wishing for more wishes, can't make anyone fall in love with you, can't bring people back from the dead. In regards to making people fall in love with you, he does seem to be able to create life though. So can you create an exact replica of the person who is in love with you? My first thought on hearing these limitations is, for my first wish, I want to remove the limit on wishes. (laughs) (laughs) I do enjoy trying to logically break wishes, but... To fully explain the power that is now at Aladdin's fingertips, Genie sings Friend Like Me, which is one of the best Disney songs, at least personally. It's my favourite in this film, and it's just relentless energy, both in terms of Williams's performance, but just they've got so many ideas of how they want this to work. I love the choice that every humanoid who appears in it is just a version of the genie, so whether it's he's got his own giant hand sort of mouthing the words, or he's opening his mouth and falling out of his own mouth, it's fantastic. It's just relentless energy and tells you everything you need to know about this character. It's once again one of those wonderful things that celebrates why animation is a medium and the things that work so well in animation. And you would be a fool to try and recreate this in any other medium. Yeah, when I'm watching this film, I just think, ah, wouldn't it be better with CGI and if it was an hour longer? (laughs) (laughs) It's weird that for all of the wonderful things they do with the animation in this song... My favourite part is just at the end when the genie's sort of lying down very cockily and there's just a neon applause sign above his head. One of my favourite jokes in the film. Aladdin, as ever, is canny and rather than just making a wish, he tricks the genie and says, I bet you're not all powerful. I bet you couldn't even get me out of this cave. And genie immediately bites and gives him a freebie and saves Aladdin from the Cave of Wonders. And Aladdin and Genie have a conversation where Aladdin asks for suggestions on what he should wish for. I love this moment. They're constantly just telling us in really small ways the content of Aladdin's character. And most people, when presented with three 
fairly unlimited wishes, their first thought would be, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do that, I need to start narrowing it down. Aladdin's first thought is just to ask the genie, what would you wish for? And it is this wonderful moment where this kind of serves the same purpose as the I want songs, but in this case for the genie, where the genie says that if he could have anything, he would want to be free because he is effectively a prisoner. And so immediately all of the audience goes, right, that's what needs to happen by the end of the film and that's what we're rooting for. And he says that it's only going to happen if a master wishes for their freedom. I love this because we've got both... Aladdin and Jasmine are characters who both feel like they are trapped and they are not free. And their objective is their own freedom. And the genie here is someone who, despite his objective being his own freedom, it can only come at another person's hand. And so obviously Aladdin says, I'll do it. Like, I'll use my last wish and I will free you. It's a really nice moment and keeps building the relationship between Aladdin and genie, which again is a really important relationship in this film. Aladdin eventually decides that for his first wish he wants to be a prince because then he thinks he'll be worthy of Jasmine because he thinks all she cares about is princes and wealth and all that sort of stuff. There is a weird subtext in this film which seems to suggest that being a member of royalty isn't actually about anything other than the clothes you're wearing. (laughs) Oh, I'd forgotten about that. (laughs) Because Aladdin wishes to be a prince... So Genie starts working on it and sorts out a new wardrobe and turns a boo into an elephant and starts preparing a whole bunch of stuff. But he doesn't seem to actually make him a prince. (laughs) It's strange. It comes with all of the things you would expect. There's a great amount of wealth. There's hundreds of people that are at his service. And again, I wonder like how many of these are creatures that Genie turned into servants, similar to a boo? Or did he just create life out of thin air? I've always assumed they're an extension of Genie, because he can create as many copies of himself as he wants. He's basically just Dr. Manhattan, but with a sense of humour. Ah, I like that. I'm going to say that basically fills in a lot of the holes around that question. No, I quite like that. So yeah, we've got Aladdin with his new outfit, his new monkey elephant, and a thousand copies of the Genie. And he's going to go to Agrabah, to woo Jasmine. Meanwhile, Jafar, realising he has no hope of getting the lamp, it's buried in the Cave of Wonders with the one person who can enter the Cave of Wonders, realises he's going to have to be stuck as the vizier forever, or rather until Jasmine gets married and there's a new sultan and then they'll immediately be executed. There's a nice bit where Iago suggests that what if Jasmine were to marry him? And they start plotting to make that happen by sort of finding a weird loophole in the law. I think it's kind of suggested that they write it in themselves, which is quite nice. They take this to the Sultan. There's a couple of nice quick jokes here where they're talking about Jasmine's marriage prospects where the Sultan says that her mother wasn't nearly as picky, which is an excellent line. <laughs> And also when Jafar suggests that he marry Jasmine and uses the hypno staff on the Sultan, the Sultan actually breaks out of it and just goes, but you're so old. <laughs> <laughs> kind of suggesting that the Sultan could always resist the hypnosis. I think it's just pushing the limits as to what <laughs> the Sultan's mind is prepared to accept. But this is all interrupted by the arrival of... Aladdin, now in the guise of Prince Ali, and we get another song sung by Robin Williams, and it's already stuck in your head. It's excellent. This is the quintessential hype song, and I find it very hard to not watch this sequence with just a huge smile on my face, and there are several parts where I'll just burst into laughter because it just it gets me every time just how ridiculous this is with the genie morphing into all these different characters and interacting with the crowd and Robin Williams' performance is just, he is at 100% here and it's fantastic. For me, it's also made even better by Jafar just looking quietly furious throughout the whole sequence. (laughs) I imagine most things are made better by Jafar looking quietly furious in the background. I can empathise with that. It's the uh, Beauty and the Beast ballroom scene. (laughs) So Prince Ali comes in and the Sultan is very easily impressed by it all. I mean, you you say very easily impressed. It's very impressive. 
Yeah, but he's very easily impressed by anything. <laughs> And it's interesting because, again, Aladdin doesn't know that Jafar is the old man who tried to kill him. And Jafar knows he recognises Ali, but just can't quite place him at this point. So, again, there's this nice moment of these characters have met before, but under different guises, which is quite fun. So Prince Ali and Jafar are both pleading with the Sultan as to how things should proceed with Jasmine. Ali's like, I should meet her and I'll woo her. And Jafar obviously desperately trying to get his plan back on track. And Jasmine just comes in and says, you're talking about my fate without me even being here. Like, I'm just some prize to be won. And again, I'm not going to say this is the most progressive or feminist film, but it's really nice that there's an explicit moment where Jasmine comes in and bollocks the men for not having any respect for her. I think it would be more feminist if the Sultan was just like, hey, you can be Sultan and you don't need to marry a man to become Sultan. You can just be it because you're great. But hey, you know, it's a step in the right direction. It's really interesting that you say that because that's basically what they do in the remake. The remake is very focused around Jasmine wanting to prove that she is a good leader and could be Sultan. It's a bit overwrought and it feels force it's definitely the right move but a big problem with it is in order to make this work they kind of suppress jasmine and have people talk down to her and tell her to be quiet and she has this whole song that she's not going to be silenced anymore and it's such a weird choice because that was not an issue with this character one of the dominant traits of jasmine is that like she speaks her mind and people will tell her to do things but she's not going to do it she's going to tell them what she wants to do instead. So yeah, it's a weird move. And the remake, I'll I'll touch on it briefly now, but the remake very much feels, it's that classic 50-year-old men writing feminism, where yes, it is the right move, but I think it's handled very sloppily. So realising that he's put his foot in it, Aladdin goes off to the gardens to consult with Jeannie to try and figure out what he can do to salvage this the genie very clearly says just like be honest like that's going to be your best option here but aladdin's still hung up on this idea that she wants a prince and how can he be more princely and also that she'll never recognize him while he's wearing a shirt (laughs) as soon as the shirt's off the pecs give it away exactly and yeah so aladdin goes to see jasmine they have a conversation on her balcony i think it's quite a nice little conversation where aladdin is just trying to say the right thing like or what he thinks is the right thing he's also got gd talking in his ear and he just messes it up and jasmine tells him to just go walk off a balcony so he does <laughs> nice little bit film ends. <laughs> <laughs> so many points in this film you could just cut to aladdin's corpse on the floor but aladdin reveals that he's got his magic carpet and offers to take princess jasmine for a ride raises eyebrows <laughs> Thus showing that, I don't know, I I really like this because there's the whole idea of that to woo her, he just needs to be himself. Like, they had a connection before. If he just tells her the truth, that connection could be rekindled. But really what sells this is the romantic magic carpet ride. I think it's certainly a factor. There's a nice moment where Aladdin offers his hand to her and says, do you trust me? Which is exactly what he does when they're trying to escape the guards earlier in the film. I think it's at this point Jasmine clocks it straight away, but she doesn't call him out on it straight away. So she climbs aboard and we get probably the most famous sequence from this film and one of the absolute stone cold Disney classics, A Whole New World. For years, I kind of resisted this song because I think it's so widely appreciated and it's very schmaltzy and it's just sort of put on this pedestal of like the perfect duet ballad and it just kind of grates on you as a while but like when you drop your cynicism it really is the perfect duet ballad it's absolutely superb i think it falls into the category of aspects of sleeping beauty or even beauty and the beast where people kind of have a certain perception in the back of their head about what it's like but when you actually sit down and watch it you go oh yeah this is absolutely rock solid particularly i think one thing that's quite subtle is that the characters start singing separately and then they overlap more and more and by the end they're singing in perfect unison which is just a really nice design choice to show the characters coming together and again echoes the opening where they're talking over each other and they both say trapped at the same time. It's great and obviously the visuals are absolutely stunning with Aladdin and Jasmine flying all over the world and ruining the Sphinx. 
We also get a preview of Musker and Clement's next film when uh, Aladdin and Jasmine end up in Greece. <laughs> Copying the design used back in Fantasia, which I said it back then, I really like that animation style for Greece. I think it's really nice and it was nice to see it back here and elaborated further on in Hercules. One thing I really enjoy is that this number goes all over the world. And obviously in animation, there's a degree of suspension of disbelief there. So you go with it. In the remake, they're like, ah, that doesn't really make much sense. So instead of showing Jasmine the world, Aladdin instead just shows her the square mile around the palace. (laughs) We've only got about two and a half minutes because that's how long (laughs) it takes to sing this song. So... It's so weird. It's just a couple of shots over the desert. They go to the coast and then they go back to the city. And I'm like, oh God, that's really bad. After this sequence, then Jasmine confronts Aladdin and says, you were the boy from the market and still trying to keep up the bluster of Prince Ali. He says he pretends to be a beggar boy sometimes and goes down there. I don't think Jasmine's buying it at this point and she just wants him to be honest with her. But, you know, she still had a magical time. They both return to the palace and they share a kiss. I really like, actually, that they kiss quite early on in the film. It's not like the big culminating thing of the end. Like, as soon as they sort of realise their feelings for each other, that's when they kiss. And there's still more to go here. Like, there's still somewhere to go in their relationship, i.e. he's still not told the truth. And I quite like that they would put that kiss in there whilst he's still lying to her. I think that's... And so, hi, and what's just happened? Aladdin returns to Abu to tell him what's happened only to see that he's been captured and immediately the guards grab Prince Ali and, on the orders of Jafar, send him to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, these guards are pretty chill with committing regicide. (laughs) That is a very good point, actually. (laughs) That is a visiting royal from another country. As Aladdin drowns, he just manages to knock the lamp so genie comes out and says that he can't save aladdin's life unless aladdin wishes for it aladdin's head bobs down and he takes that as a yes we all know genie's bending the rules because he really likes aladdin and he saves his life and there's just a really nice moment with the two of them together and i really like this moment i think it's really sweet I think it's very believable and the chemistry between these characters is great. There's a really nice little line where Genie's like, don't scare me like that. I'm growing really fond of you. Not that I want to pick out curtains or anything, which makes me laugh every single time. (laughs) Meanwhile, back at the palace, Jasmine's incredibly happy. She's finally met the right man for her and her dad shows up and informs her that he's picked out a husband, and then he just opens the door, and Jafar's up there, (laughs) looking as menacing as always. It's obvious the Sultan's hypnotised, but presumably since this has been happening for years, Jasmine doesn't recognise it. But before she can be made to go through with it, Aladdin shows up, recognises what's going on, and smashes Jafar's staff, breaking the hypnosis, and the Sultan orders guards to take Jafar away to be executed. As Jafar is being taken away, though, he spots something in Prince Ali's clothing. He sees the lamp from earlier. Suddenly, it all makes sense, and with renewed hope and not wanting to be captured, in a mad fit of rage, Jafar grabs a small vial, throws it to the ground, creating a smoke cloud, allowing him to escape. I love how many tricks and gadgets Jafar has in this film. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, got... it's the fact that all of the tricks and gadgets are so incredibly dramatic as well. It's awesome. And I love when him and Iago retreat to their secret room. Iago's just like, well, we're dead. <laughs> <laughs> he just gives up and accepts it straight away. Starts packing a bag. Meanwhile, Jafar is just laughing maniacally it's such a good villain laugh at this point like he's just snapped it all makes sense he has an option and it's great and his plan is to get iago to steal the lamp before that point we get a scene where aladdin basically turns on all his friends he tells genie he can't wish him free yet because without genie he's nothing genie not too surprised but obviously fairly disappointed goes to sulk in his lamp and Aladdin also snaps at Abu and Carpet and they go off looking sad. It makes me wonder how the genie situation works because if you're right that all of the wealth and the servants are extensions of genie, I assume the wish basically is worthless after you've made the third wish. Like these wishes are just temporary. 
when I was watching it this time, I was like, okay, the rule seems to be that when the lamp gets a new master, the old wishes are undone, right? That seems to be kind of how things resolve at the end, which sort of makes sense. Although, when ownership of the lamp passes from Aladdin to Jafar, since one of Aladdin's wishes was to save his life, presumably he should just drop dead. I don't think they get undone. I think specifically that Jafar undoes them with the powers that he himself wishes for. But you're right about the earlier wish of becoming a prince just being the set of clothes, because it seems that without the genie, all Aladdin has left is the set of clothes. (laughs) Which he shortly loses because Iago successfully steals the lamp. Can I just point out how great a guy Iago is (laughs) for stealing the lamp? And not using it. <laughs> That's a very good point. I guess he knows that he probably shouldn't mess with Jafar. Just ends with, ends with you at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> the scene where Jafar rubs his newly attained lamp and Genie comes out ready to just have a go at Aladdin for bothering him and sees that it's Jafar is great. Just that moment of like, ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> The Sultan is preparing to announce the engagement between Ali and Jasmine. Aladdin's finally built up the courage to tell the truth to Jasmine, but it's all interrupted by Jafar coming and just being a dick to everyone. Jafar shows up and for his first wish, wishes to be made Sultan on high. So Genie literally lifts the palace up onto a hereful to unseen (laughs) cliff and magically moves the sultan's clothes onto Jafar, again suggesting that in this world, whoever wears the clothes has the title. (laughs) Also, a nice little touch, Iago gets a little sultan's hat as well. (laughs) He does, doesn't he? (laughs) Can I just point out, I think Jafar looks great in the sultan's outfit. It's a shame he only wears it for about 10 seconds, (laughs) because... When he commands Jasmine and the Sultan to bow before him, he wishes his second wish to become the most powerful sorcerer in the world, and using his magic forces them to bow. And Aladdin tries to intervene, but Genie can't do anything because Jafar's his master, and Jafar gets the closest he gets to a song, which is a reprise of Prince Ali. It's a pretty great reprise. It's maniacal. It's very different sounding, obviously, like it's much more sinister. And again, as all great songs and musicals do, it develops the story. It's at this point that just before Aladdin was able to tell Jasmine the truth, Jafar reveals it instead and then sends Aladdin to the other side of the world by destroying his own palace too. He can rebuild it. He can basically do anything at this point. (laughs) I really like the short scene on the frozen mountain. I think it really benefits from that 3D model of the tower being able to roll. You get this really cinematic set piece from it. Obviously, Aladdin is distraught. This is all his fault. He realizes that if he just freed the genie when he had the chance, because he has had that chance now, like he's had his two wishes. I still don't really understand what he was planning on doing by keeping, like, was he just planning on keeping the genie enslaved forever, like never making his third wish? That's quite mean. Anyway, point is, He realises his mistake, he finds a boo, and he also stumbles upon Carpet. Manages to save them both from the rolling tower, and very quickly flies back to Agrabah. In fact, it could be a while. I think quite a lot has changed since he left, because when we resume back in Agrabah, what's Jafar up to? Before we see Aladdin stuck on the frozen waste, the last thing we see is Jafar laughing like an absolute psychopath and Jasmine and the Sultan cowering in his shadow. When we cut back, he's just got this opulent palace designed to humiliate them. The Sultan's strung up like a puppet and being force-fed crackers, and Jasmine's been trussed up in a sultry slave outfit, and Jafar's propositioning her. When she refuses, he asks the genie to make her fall in love with him. The genie starts talking back just as Aladdin arrives. Jasmine seeing this as Jasmine seeing this as the opportunity pretends to have fallen in love with Jafar and works on distracting him so Aladdin can get to the lamp. I like that the genie is about to start his spiel that he said to Aladdin at the start, suggesting that this is just a rehearsed bit that he does for all of his masters, complete with the impressions as well. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, there's a really good bit where Aladdin is going to sneak up and try and take the lamp back as Jasmine is distracting Jafar, which culminates in, I I quite like it, where 
Jasmine kisses Jafar and just everyone just stops what they're doing in disgust. Yeah, Jasmine really takes one for the team there. And not only that, they let her down. All Aladdin had to do was keep doing what he was doing and everything would have been fine. Yeah, Jasmine's great. (laughs) Why are we arguing about this? (laughs) But Jafar sees a reflection of Aladdin in the crown he gave Jasmine, so that was handy. I will say, the outfit he gives her, whilst it's clearly, you know, sexy, it doesn't seem particularly any more sexy than what she was wearing. No, but it's red and she has her hair up. (laughs) So, Jafar stops Aladdin with a blast of magic from his cobra staff and utters a line which, at first I was like, oh, he's exaggerating, but actually I was like, yeah, he says... How many times do I have to kill you, boy? Because at this point, Jafar's tried to kill Aladdin three separate times. <laughs> and this leads us to the climax of the film. Jafar is an all-powerful sorcerer. He is in complete control. He basically takes everyone else out of action. He unravels carpet, which is genuinely harrowing. He turns a boo into a little monkey toy. And... For Jasmine, he just puts her in a giant hourglass that's slowly filling with sand, crushing her to death. It's awful. They're all based on him being able to make puns, to be fair. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Which, again, that's not something he wished for, so Jafar always had the ability to do that. My only complaint about this scene is, in an earlier draft, Jasmine got herself out of the hourglass, whereas in the final version, Aladdin frees her. I think they ran out of time to put that in, which is a shame because it undermines Jasmine's character a little bit. From my understanding, they just couldn't get the logic of it working. They wanted Jasmine in the hourglass so they could make the pun, but they would also have to have her in the hourglass with something that she can use to break out of it, and they couldn't get that logic working, so they just sort of, because they were running out of time, said, we'll just have Aladdin run up and smash it himself. And it is a shame. I think they could have maybe figured something out, but like I have no idea what they could have done to get something in that hourglass with her. So just to be clear, they sat down and went, well, on the one hand, we've got Jasmine's character and persona as a young, confident woman who's self-sufficient and able to sort things out and doesn't need men to save her. But on the other hand, we've got this great pun about time running out. Uh, one of them's going to have to go. <laughs> Are you suggesting they made the wrong decision? (laughs) Look, they could have done it and just had the crown that she's got on her head. She uses the point of it to cut the glass and get out. There's your solution. This final confrontation between Jafar and Aladdin is superb. Jafar's casting all sorts of spells. He's summoning swords and fire. He turns into a snake. It's great. I'm not a huge fan of the animation on the snake. Just going to say it. I think... Maybe it's a bit of a rush job. I know it's not the animators who did Jafar. It was a separate team entirely. In fact, I was thinking it was just one person who did the animation on the snake. I can't remember the name, unfortunately. I do apologise. But its proportions just shift a bit too much and it never quite looks consistent. And I know it's not in the film much, but it is the climax of your film and I do wish it were better. I think the problem is... You can tell it's not a sort of realistically proportioned snake, but also it doesn't really have any of Jafar's features. It's kind of in that weird middle ground where it's not a Jafar-esque snake and it's not a realistic snake. It's just a kind of middle ground. But personally, I really like it. And it leads to the finale of the film where Aladdin is trapped in the coils and again, using his quick wits, he tricks Jafar by saying, the genie's more powerful than you'll ever be causing Jafar to wish to become a genie. I really like this because Aladdin fully understands what he's doing, but the genie doesn't. And when the genie grants this wish, there's just a moment where he's just like, great work, Al. And again, it's a nice parallel because Aladdin's learned his lesson that wealth and power aren't the important thing, whereas Jafar is very much of the opinion that they are. I tend to defer to Jafar on this. (laughs) In my own experiences. (laughs) Well, yeah, because up until that final wish, Jafar was doing great. He had wealth, he had power, and he had freedom. He just took it a step too far. So really, what's important is getting as much wealth and power as you can without relinquishing your freedom. There's the moral, kids. Can that be the tagline for Wally Gisnep's animated classic? (laughs) Get as much money and power as you can without relinquishing your freedom. Of course, as you say, being a genie comes at the price of your freedom and Jafar is sucked into his own newly crafted black lamp and he grabs Iago and drags him down with him. 
And Genie, seeing the opportunity, baseball throws Jafar into the Cave of Wonders. I understand Jafar being sucked into the lamp and surviving, but that should have just crushed and killed Iago. <laughs> well, Jafar must be using his magic to spitefully <laughs> shapeshift Iago. And so with Jafar defeated, all of his wishes are reverted. And the kingdom goes back to the state it was before. Aladdin is also down his wishes. And Genie not wanting his friend to go without the true love that he's found, tells Aladdin, just wish for it and I will make you a prince and you can have your happily ever after. Which is a really moving moment, except for the fact that he's already wished for that. So why is he no longer a prince? (laughs) And another thing, I love this film, don't get me wrong, but the law of this land is ridiculous because all this has been because the Sultan says there's a law that says the princess must be married before she reaches a certain age. There's no clear explanation of what the consequences are if she doesn't. It's pretty clear from every other instance of law breaking in the film that the consequence would be execution. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that might make more sense then. But then the Sultan just says, well, I'm just going to change the law so you don't have to do that. And you're like, oh, cool. Thanks, Dad. You could have maybe sorted that out earlier (laughs) when you said you wanted me to be happy. Because it kind of suggests the Sultan was doing this on purpose. Yeah, let's just say it was Jafar's influence why he didn't change it before. I've talked about tearjerker moments in Disney films. And this moment, it gets me every single time. It might be just my favourite moment in these films which is as the genie is preparing for Aladdin's final wish, ready to turn him into a prince, Aladdin just says, Genie, I wish for your freedom, keeping his promise to the genie. And Alan Menken jumps in with just an amazing score and I just burst into tears. It's a really nice moment. The genie's so taken aback by it and he's absolutely delighted to have his freedom. He's bouncing all over the place. Can I just say that similar to in Cinderella when we established mice wearing clothes and then saw a naked Gus, something looks really wrong about the genie without those shackles. I know, right? I feel I'm looking at something I shouldn't be seeing. And we get a really nice line where Aladdin and the genie hug and genie says, you'll always be a prince to me. The Sultan arbitrarily changes the law so Jasmine and Aladdin can get married and then we cut to them in their marriage garb singing a reprise of A Whole New World whilst flying on carpet. And then one last thing is, as they fly off into the sunset, the sun turns around and it has the genie's face. He lifts up the screen and says, made you look, and the film ends. I'm terrified by the implications of a free genie. Considering that's the plot of The Return of Jafar is... Jafar wanting to be free. Basically, that tells us the only thing standing in the way of the world's destruction is the fact that the genie doesn't want to. I mean, for all we know, Liam, at the start of time, there was just the genie and one person and they wished for the world to be created. If I really want to blow your mind. That's uh, number three in our top 10 Disney fan theories. So before we give our final thoughts on 1992's Aladdin, Liam, is there anything else we need to talk about there's just one more thing and i think it's going to be fairly easy today i think we're going to both be in agreement we need to decide who the sexiest character in aladdin is so ben who is the sexiest character in aladdin and why is it jafar (laughs) so i would say aladdin falls into the category of either male or female lead i think are perfectly viable choices if someone said to me they found aladdin or jasmine the sexiest character i'd place no judgment there that said when i was watching this with someone i said so who do you think the sexiest character in this film is they immediately said jafar (laughs) without any irony (laughs) as the film went on they said i think he's sexier the less you look or think about him (laughs) because that screams sexy to me (laughs) I love Jafar so, so much. But yeah, I think Aladdin and Jasmine, it's a two-way tie. I will just add that this is really the start of a trend that's not particularly great, where non-white females are often overtly sexualized in Disney. And Jasmine's often regarded as one of the sexiest Disney princesses. And you you mentioned earlier things about like her attire, her midriff's always showing. There's she's got this very sort of sexually charged moment with Jafar. We didn't have that with our white heroines in The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. But we have it here. She is uncomfortably sexualized. I've got a massive soft spot for Aladdin, like easily one of my childhood crushes. So I'm going to agree with you and say that it's either of the leads, but with that caveat, 
And obviously we do the sexiest character feature somewhat flippantly. I think it's important to note that there is genuinely a lot of uncomfortableness around the age of a lot of these characters. I think Ariel, Aurora, Jasmine, to a certain extent Pocahontas, are sexualized, And these characters are not particularly old. They're normally around the age of 16, which is just a little bit too young. I think Snow White's meant to be 14, but that was the 1930s. Not that that's excusing it, but it just, I think cultural attitudes are very different then. I enjoy that in an early version of the script, the law was that the princess needs to marry a prince before her 16th birthday, but Jeffrey Katzenberg was just like, eh, let's just cut that line. We'll still keep everything else the same, but we just won't tell the audience that she's turning 16. The only other question remaining then is... Is Aladdin worthy of going on the list of Wally Gisnep's animated classics? Liam, what are your thoughts? I don't really feel the need to be coy about this. I absolutely love this film. I also think of the three films in which Howard Ashman was heavily involved, this might be my favourite, though I feel that may just be because it's the one I've watched most recently. And (laughs) that could change any day of the week, but I absolutely love this film. I think the characters are incredible. I think the story is wonderful. There's really excellent setup and payoff throughout the film. The villain is one of the best performances we've had in years. I'm aware of the cultural problems with this film and as I say a lot of that was addressed quite well in the remake but it is an issue in the original that said I think as a film and as a narrative it is absolutely wonderful and I adore it and I want it to go on the list this isn't my favorite Disney film but I still think it's a fantastic film I think the back-to-back of Beauty and the Beast Aladdin and the Lion King is the best three in a row you get in the Disney timeline. But I do think Aladdin is the weakest of those three films. And it wasn't until this watch that I could really put my finger on why. Because out of every Disney animated classic, I would say Aladdin is the most fun film of all of them. You'll have an absolute blast watching this film every single time. And it does what it's trying to do perfectly. The reason I mark it down slightly compared to Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King, and even The Little Mermaid as well, is I think it's trying to do something different and therefore it lacks some of the emotional heft of those films. There's some really nice moments in this. The ending with Aladdin and the genie is really nice. Obviously, A Whole New World is a really beautiful sequence, but it's trying to be a slightly different kind of film. That said, it's absolutely superb, and it's definitely going on the list, no doubt. So with that, we open the vault and retrieve the manuscript itself, Wally Gisnep's animated classics. Ben. Well, I've used two of my wishes, Liam. One of them was to condemn the Black Cauldron to never be spoken about again. The second was getting to rewatch Beauty and the Beast, so for my third wish, I'd like to put Aladdin on the list of Wally Gisnep's animated classics. Jafar wished for being a sorcerer, and you spent three of your wishes on Disney film-related things that you could have done without the use of a genie. <laughs> and with that, our wishes are used up, and the lamp flies back to the Cave of Wonders for the next person to pick up. Now, this is really interesting because when we started this, we we discussed possible names for this project, and I loved your suggestion of Wally Gisnet. The part of me was always concerned about legal issues. Obviously, this is a very small project, but, you know, Monopoly Mouse is going to Monopoly Mouse if we're referencing a trademarked image of the Walt Disney signature. Maybe we won't be able to do that forever. And I often thought about what we could pivot or rebrand to where we're not restricted by legal reasons or even restricted to the Walt Disney films themselves because we may want to look at other films. And with this, all three of the films which were creatively led by Howard Ashman have made it onto this list. And I have to say, if we ever have to rebrand, my vote's going for a Howard Ashman animated classic because... (laughs) Every film of his has made it onto this list, which the same cannot be said for Walt Disney himself. (laughs) (laughs) And that's exactly the sort of topic we want to hear your opinions on, as well as the film Aladdin. Was it a film you grew up with and have a soft spot for? Is it one you've revisited recently? Do you agree with mine and Liam's gushing over it? Or are those insensitivities and flaws just enough to sway it the other way? As always, we're keen to hear your opinions on both the film Aladdin and who you think the sexiest character in the film is. 
And of course, if you're watching along at home, you're going to need to know what we're looking at next time. Liam, which film are we looking at next week? Hakuna Matata, Ben. That's right. Next week, we're taking a dive through the circle of life and looking at 1994's The Lion King. It's a film that needs no further introduction. I think we've both got a lot to say on it. So we'll see you next time for The Lion King. And this has been Wally Giznep's Animated Classics.